fact, and I know that other colleagues of mine, uh, former Foreign Office people, have said that they believe the time has now come to review the policy because of the clear, to the layman at least, uh, disrespect for international humanitarian law that has happened on Israel's side. So I'm open to that discussion. I don't agree with Boris Johnson that it would be a, you know, in effect, abandoning Israel if we were to do it. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves, it's going to change the situation. The government has come under pressure to stop arms sales to Israel after the deaths of seven aid workers in Gaza. Israel has admitted that was a grave mistake. In his column yesterday, the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson said suspending arms sales would be a shameful, a shameful move which would amount to willing the military defeat of Israel and the victory of Hamas. Today, the Foreign Secretary Lord Cameron has warned Israel that Britain's support is not unconditional and it must abide by international humanitarian law. On this programme earlier, the Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden said this was not a threat to suspend arms sales. No, it's, it's not a threat. And Carol, as, as you rightly say, this is six months on from that horrific attack on the people of Israel. 1,400 men, women and children murdered. And Israel is still in a state of deep trauma, facing an existential threat from Hamas and it's entirely right that uh, Israel should be able to remove that threat facing its nation but at the same time as we would do with many other countries around the world we demand high standards of Israel by the way not that we remotely expect the terrorist organization that it's facing that's why we've raised concerns about getting aid in and there's been welcome steps on that and we've raised concerns about getting uh, making sure there's deconfliction that is to say that uh, people who are providing aid, and we saw that terrible uh, example uh, in the past week or so, uh, are not attacked. Those are the sort of legitimate conversations we should be having with Israel. Well, joining me now is Sir Simon Fraser, former head of the Foreign Office and Diplomatic Service, now managing partner at Flint Global. Good morning to you, Sir Simon. Good morning. Um, uh, we are hearing calls on both sides here. Um, having been there at the Foreign Office, do you think we've reached the stage where we should be suspending arms sales to Israel? Well, I mean, we can discuss that, but just to start, I mean, whether or not we sell arms to Israel is a small part of a much bigger problem here about how we address and seek to end this conflict. But, And I'd like to come back to that. But having said that, uh, I mean, wh whether or not we sell arms to Israel, frankly, is not going to be decisive. Uh, uh, on that issue that I've just described. We don't actually sell that many, uh, so therefore it's not going to have a huge impact on Israel. If the Americans and the Germans were to suspend selling arms to Israel, that would be a very different matter. So, it, first of all, don't think it's a panacea. Having said that, in my own view, I think there is a very reasonable case for re-examining this position, given what's happened and the appalling conduct of this uh, operation in Gaza by Israel over the last six months, and I know that other colleagues of mine, uh, former Foreign Office people, have said that they believe the time has now come to review the policy because of the clear, to the layman at least, uh, disrespect for international humanitarian law that has happened on Israel's side. So I'm open to that discussion. I don't agree with Boris Johnson that it would be a, you know, in effect, abandoning Israel if we were to do it. Uh, but let's not kid ourselves, it's going to change the situation. It, it, clearly, uh, and we're going to be talking in more detail about this in a moment, we, we don't sell a huge amount to Israel, but it would send out an important signal uh, and it could influence how other foreign governments uh, view all of this. And we've seen President Biden taking uh, an increasingly robust stance uh, with Israel. So, I mean, why do you think, when we look at what is happening in Israel, the warnings we're getting from humanitarian agencies, from the United Nations, about the scale of the humanitarian disaster unfolding, um, that we're hearing from Oliver Dowden, that there's now, uh, so far, apparently, no change in the advice? I think, I, I don't know the answer on the legal advice in the government, and I, I'm, I don't you know, can't go into the great detail of that because I'm just not you know, in the loop. But the point is that the broader point is this, that Western policy has been inadequate on this conflict. We haven't done enough. Uh, well, I think we were stunned at first by the appalling nature of the Hamas attack, and we have to remember that. But we sort of then virtually gave Israel carte blanche 
for example, over cutting off food and power and aid into Gaza. And we have failed to hold the Israeli government, which is, you know, which has a lot of very extreme nationalist members in it. Uh, we failed to hold them to account for respecting international law, frankly. And now we've responded because the pain has come visibly to our own door with the terrible attack uh, and death of the seven Western aid workers. But we have not given sufficient account to the deaths, for example, of over nearly 200, I think, other aid workers, mainly Palestinians. But beyond that, over 30,000 Palestinian civilians, most of whom were innocent, 12,000 Palestinian children, never mind the tens of thousands who were uh, more who've been maimed and the hundreds of thousands who've been displaced. So coming now to this debate about UK arms sales at this point, that's fine and it's important and it could be an important signal, but we need a broader uh, questioning of how Western policy can be effectively leveraged now uh, on both sides, on Israel, on the Palestinians and on Hamas, in order to try to end this terrible suffering. So what more could the British government be doing? I mean, we, we are hearing that there is the prospect of at least a resumption of negotiations on what would be presumably uh, another uh, pause, uh, a, a, a temporary ceasefire rather than anything more long-lasting. What more do you think that British and other Western leaders could be doing? Well, I think the, the, the fact that, that there is apparently a resumption of negotiations towards a ceasefire is welcome. I'm not optimistic that that is going to uh, come to fruition in the near term, however. There is this really difficult issue over the hostages. The hostages should be returned. Of course, there are many other detainees, Palestinian detainees uh, and prisoners on the other side. Uh, Israel has a legitimate concern that if there's a ceasefire, Hamas might exploit it. Uh, to regroup. So I can see that there are sensitivities, but we must support the process of achieving a ceasefire and getting more humanitarian aid into Gaza. And I welcome the steps that, in, the other, including by the British government, just announced uh, to, to improve that situation, although frankly, it's a drop in the ocean. We must support that process. At the same time, if you look at the bigger picture, uh, how can pressure effectively be uh, brought to bear it, uh, most of this comes down to Washington. In the end, the only country that has real leverage uh, on the Israeli government, and indeed more broadly in the region, is the United States. Clearly, the American position has been toughening, but in an American presidential year, presidential election year, it is very difficult in US policy, in US politics, to apply pressure. So we need to work with our allies. We need to work with other Europeans and with the Americans we need to support the process in the region to try to get to a ceasefire. And we need to bear in mind that that is just the beginning of an approach to ending this terrible problem, the humanitarian situation, the reconstruction issues, and of course, the longer term core issue of the status of Palestine and the rights of Palestinians, which we have failed to address in recent years. Of course, the United States is the big player in this, as in so many other things. And we do now see that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu appears to be opening up new routes to allow humanitarian aid in after those warnings from President Biden that he would not be prepared to, that his support was not conditionally, with very similar words. Um, I mean, how closely do you think that we have to follow the Americans? I mean, we heard David Lammy, um, who could, could quite conceivably be our next foreign secretary, saying that he's very concerned already that there have been breaches of humanitarian international law um, by the Israelis. Yes. Well, he's right to be because, you know, whatever the lawyers say, uh, you know, if you look at the facts, it seems highly probable that that is the case. But on your first point, I mean, of course, we shouldn't slavishly follow American policy. And I think it was a failure of British policy in the early days that we did sort of just uh, repeat uh, uh, things that were said in Washington without adding our own uh, view to it. I think actually David Cameron, since he became Foreign Secretary, has improved our policy on this. He has nuanced it. He has set out very clear positions on hum the humanitarian situation and so forth. So we have a more distinctive British voice, and I welcome that. But at the same time, let's be realistic. That voice is not going to be the decisive voice in the region. It can be one of many, and it should be one of many. 
uh, working with other allies, as I say, in Europe, in America, and in the region. But in the end, the most decisive and influential voice is the American one. And what you saw last week yeah. is that when Biden actually applies some pressure, uh, Netanyahu responds. Finally, and just briefly, it's a big question, but we're seeing those demonstrations happening today on the sixth month anniversary since um, the Hamas attacks uh, in Israel. Um, what about Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, as someone who has, has watched this situation and uh, events in the Middle East unfold? Do you think he is um, under serious threat or um, do you think that um, the, the past master at clinging on to power is going to be able to ride this out? He is under serious threat and that's many people believe and I share this view that that's one of the reasons why uh, he is not inclined to bring this situation to a rapid end because he knows that once it ends he is going to face uh, the music in Israel and the demonstrations we've seen in the last few days uh, bear that out so he is under threat he is aligned in government with a very unappetizing group of people in terms of the policies that they're pursuing and I think the popularity of the government in Israel is eroding so yes he's a past master but I think you have to ask yourself the question, where is this, all this leading for Israel? What is the long-term view, vision that he has for Israel? I can't see the way out. I think they are storing up more problems in the future, more radicalized uh, Palestinians who, whether it's Hamas or future Hamases, will feel that they have no choice but to take up arms uh, against Israel. So in the end, any Israeli government and the international community need to find a credible way of addressing the legitimate interests both of Israel and of Palestinians if there's ever going to be an end to this sorry saga.